an exhortation to the practical contemplation of this doctrine and the way of believing. I know that for many this is too much neglected. Yes, of all the evils that I've seen in the days of my pilgrimage, now drawn to their close, there is none so grievous as a public contempt for the principal mysteries of the gospel among those who are called Christians. Religion in the profession is some is withered in its vital principles and weakened in its nerves and sinews, even if it is pulled off with outward happiness and confidence. Therefore, my exhortation is to be diligent in the contemplation of this glory of Christ, in the exercise of your thoughts about him, unless you are diligent in this duty it is impossible you will be steady in the principal acts of faith, or ready for the principal duties of obedience. The principal act of faith respects the divine person of Christ, as all Christians must acknowledge, but you can never achieve this if you do not see the glory in his condescension. If you reduce your notions to your own experience, you will find that in this your faith stands or falls. And the principal duty of your obedience is self-denial, with the readiness for the cross. The consideration of the condescension of Christ is a principal evangelical motive and truth that establishes this obedience. As the Apostle declares in Philippians 2 verse 5, And none of us denies ourselves in a right manner, if we do not do so on the consideration of the self-denial of the Son of God. For what are the things that we are to deny ourselves? Or what should we let go of that we pretend to have a right to? It is our goods, our liberties, our relationships, and our lives. And what are any or all of them in themselves considering our condition and the purpose for which we were made? They are perishing things that no matter what we choose will be separated from us forever by death within a few short days. Things that under the power of a fever or illness will be lost to us. But with respect to these things, how incomparable is that condescension of Christ, which we have given an account. Consider what he parts with when he made himself of no reputation. Therefore, if we find an unwillingness or resistance in our minds about these things when called to them in a way of duty, one view by faith, of the glory of Christ and this condescension will be an effective cure of that sinful discontent. We can behold the glory of Christ by faith here, as we will do it by sight hereafter. If we see no glory in it, if we cannot discern that which is the subject of eternal admiration, we walk in darkness. It is the most incredible effect of divine wisdom and grace. Where are our hearts and minds if we can see no glory in it? I know in the contemplation of it we will quickly find our reason overwhelmed and our understanding at a loss. But I desire to be brought to this loss every day. For when faith can no longer operate in comprehension, finding the object is fixed on to be too great and glorious to be brought into the capacities of the mind. It will result, as we said before, in holy admiration, humble adoration, and joyful thanksgiving. Then we find our souls filled with joy. Then it's inexpressible and filled with glory. First Peter 1 8. The glory of Christ in his love. In portraying the Son of God's acceptance and discharge of his office of mediator, the scriptures most eminently represent his love as a soul impelling reason and primary motivation in Galatians 2.20. Here, he is indescribably glorious, for the chief brightness of glory consists in the glory of divine love. It is amiable and infinitely refreshing, and there is nothing of dread or fear accompanying it. Now, so that we may take a view of the glory of Christ by faith. We must inquire into the nature of this love. The love of the Father. The love of the Father is the eternal cause of the whole work of Christ, and the acceptance of his office for the redemption and salvation of the church, which is continually affirmed in Scripture. 
and his love of the Father acted itself in his eternal decrees before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1 verse 4 And afterward, in the sending of his Son to render it effectual, John 3 verse 16, Originally this love was shown by his eternal election of a portion of mankind to be brought into a relationship with himself through the mystery of the blood of Christ. In the sanctification of the Spirit, Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5, this eternal act of the will of God the Father does not imply any approval of or complacency in the state and condition of those who are elected. It only designs a way for them to be accepted and approved. And this is called his love on several accounts. 1. It is part of God's character. It is an act suited to the glorious excellency of his nature in which he is love. For God is love. 1 John 4, verses 8 and 9. And the first expression of the divine properties must, therefore, be an act of communicative love, because this election is an eternal act of the will of God. He can have no original cause but what is in himself. If we could look through all the treasures of his divine qualities, we would find none that could be so properly ascribed to his motivation as that of love. Number two, it is free and undeserved. It is called love because it is free and undeserved with respect to anything on our part. For whenever someone does good for another, it is completely undeserved and for their benefit. It is an act of love and can have no other cause. And this is the case with respect to our eternal election. There was nothing in us and nothing foreseen in us from within ourselves that should move the will of God in any way toward this election, for whatever is good in the best of us, and it is an effect of election, not to cause, Ephesians 1, 4. Therefore, as it works to our eternal good, the spring of it must be love. Number 3. It results in acts of love. The fruits or effects of it are inconceivable acts of love. It is by multiplied acts of love that it is made effective. The love is a son. This is the eternal spring that is provided to the church through the mediation of Christ. And the design of the eternal love of the Father was initiated and accomplished by the love of the Son, which we'll now inquire into by the light of the following observations. Number one, we were created in God's image. The whole number or community of the elect were creatures made in the image of God and by this in a state of love with him. All that we were, had, or hoped for were the effects of divine goodness and love. And the life of our souls was love to God, and a blessed state it was preparatory for the eternal life of love in heaven. Number two, we fell by sin. From the state we fell by sin into a state of enmity with God, which is a source of all miseries, both temporal and eternal. Number three, we were redeemable. Notwithstanding this woeful catastrophe of our first state, our nature on many accounts was still recoverable to fellowship with God, as I have declared in detail elsewhere. And number four, Christ had compassion on us. In this condition, the first act of loving Christ toward us was in pity and compassion. A creature who is made in the image of God and fallen into misery, yet still capable of recovery, is a proper object of divine compassion. That which is so celebrated in Scripture as a pity and compassion of God or as acts of divine love toward us on the consideration of our distress and misery. But all compassion ceases toward those whose condition is irrecoverable. Therefore, the Lord Christ did not pity the angels who fell, because their nature was not redeemable. Hebrews 2 verse 16, Isaiah 63 verse 9 and 5. Christ delighted to redeem us as we lay under the eyes of Christ in our misery. We were the objects of his pity and compassion, but since he saw us as recoverable out of that state, his love worked in and by delight. It was an inconceivable delight to him to consider the deliverance of mankind to the glory of God, which is also an act of love. 
See this divinely expressed in Proverbs 8, verses 30 and 31, which has been explained elsewhere. Number 6. Christ was motivated by love. If we ask, from where did the compassion and delight of Christ arise? And what was the cause of them? How is it that he who is eternally blessed in his own self-sufficiency should so deeply concern himself in their lost and forlorn condition? I say he did so merely from the infinite love and goodness of his own nature, without the least endowment from us, or anything in us. Titus 3, 5. Number 7. He is prepared to suffer for us in the context of his readiness, willingness, and delight, which arose from his love and compassion. The counsel of God proposed to him the way of our recovery. Now, this is a way of great difficulties and perplexities for him, that is, to his person, as it was to be constituted. To the divine nature, nothing is grievous or difficult but he was to have another nature that would undertake the difficulties of this way and work. It was required of him that he should pity us until he had not left any to pity himself, when he stood most in need of it, that he should pursue his delight to save us, until his own soul was heavy and sorrowful to death, and that he should relieve our sufferings by suffering the same things that we should have experienced. But this did not deter him in the least from undertaking this work of love and mercy for us. Rather, his love rose on this proposal like the waters of a mighty stream against opposition. For on this prospect, he says, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Hebrews 10, 7. It was his delight to do it. Number 8. He took on flesh for us. Christ was inclined, disposed, and ready in the eternal love of his divine person to undertake the office of mediator for the work of our redemption. Therefore a body was prepared for him. In this body, where he made our human nature his own, he planned to make this love effectual in all of its inclinations and actions. It was provided for him for this purpose, and filled with all grace in a way that was unmeasurable especially with fervent love for mankind. And by this, his body became a suitable instrument to carry out his eternal love in all of its fruits. Number nine, Christ's love was both divine and human. It is clear that this glorious love of Christ does not consist solely in the eternal actions of his divine person. Earth the divine nature in his person, this... It's the love of the Father, namely, his eternal purpose and approval to communicate grace and glory. But there is yet more in the love of Christ. For when he exercised his love, he was also a man and not God only. And in none of those eternal acts of love could the human nature of Christ have any involvement. Yet, it is the love of the man Christ Jesus that is celebrated in the scriptures. Number 10. Christ loved us with his whole person. Therefore, this love of Christ that we inquire into is the love of his person. That is, the love that he in his own person acts through his distinct natures according to their distinct essential properties. The acts of love in these distinct natures are infinitely distinct and different, yet they are all acts of one and the same person. So then... Whether it is an act of love in Christ that we would consider to be an eternal act in the divine nature in the person of the Son of God, or whether it is an act of the human nature performed in time by the gracious faculties and powers of that nature, it is still the love of one, the same person, Christ Jesus. It was an act of inexpressible love in him that he assumed our nature, but it was an act in and of his divine nature only because it was prior to the existence of his human nature, which could not, therefore, concur therein. His laying down his life for us was an act of inconceivable love, 1 John 3.16. Yet, it was only an act of the human nature when he offered himself and died. 
But both the one and the other were acts of his divine person, which is why it is said that God laid down his life for us and purchased a church with his own blood. X 2028. 20, Our duty of contemplation. My present business is to exhort all of us to the contemplation of Christ's glory, even though it is only a little, a very little. Did I can conceive in less than that very little that I can express, yet may it be my duty to excite not only myself but also others to necessary inquiries into it, which leads me to offer the following exhortations. First, labor to keep your minds continually fitted and prepared for such heavenly contemplations. If they are carnal and sensual, are filled with earthly things, the due sense of this love of Christ and his glory will not abide in you. Virtue and vice in their highest degrees are not more diametrically opposed in the same mind than a habitual course of sensual worldly thoughts and a due contemplation of the glory of the love of Christ. In fact, even a sincere mind that is filled with a multitude of thoughts about the everyday events of life is hindered in a right communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a few of us whose minds are prepared in a due manner for this duty. The behavior and speech of most give evidence of the inward state of their souls. They run back and forth in their thoughts, which are continually led by their passions into every corner of the earth. It is vain to call such persons to contemplations of the glory of Christ and his love. They lack the required mindset, a holy composure of mind based on spiritual principles an inclination to seek after refreshment in heavenly things and a desire to bathe the soul in the fountain of them with the constant thoughts of the excellency of this divine glory. Second, do not satisfy yourself with general notions concerning the love of Christ which represent no glory to the mind. Many deceive themselves in this way. Everyone who believes in his divine person professes to value his love, to even consider others who think otherwise to not be Christians, but they only have general notions and not any distinct conceptions of his love, they really do not know what it is. To deliver us from this snare, we must engage in specific meditations on his principal concerns. First, whose love it is? This is the love of the divine person of the Son of God. He is expressly called God with respect to the exercise of this love. Always consider what love it is, by this we know love. Did he lay down his life for us? 1 John 3.16 Number 2. By what ways and means it acts? In the divine nature, this wonderful love of the Son of God is shown by eternal acts of wisdom, goodness, and grace that are aligned to that nature. And in the human nature, it is expressed by point-in-time acts of pity and compassion with all the fruits of working and suffering for us. Number 3. How undeserved it is. Consider the freedom of Christ's love. That he gave without any deserving on our part. 1 John 4.10 It was hatred, not love, that we deserved in ourselves. This is a consideration suited to fill the soul with self-abasement, which is one of the best frames for the contemplation of the glory of Christ. Number 4. What fruits it produces. Consider the efficacy of it in our fruits and effects, with many other considerations of this kind. A distinct view and admiration of the things your soul may walk in this paradise of God, gathering here and there a heavenly flower that conveys a sweet savor of this love of Christ. Furthermore, do not be content to have right notions of the love of Christ in your minds, unless... You can attain a gracious taste of it in your hearts. That would be to see a richly prepared feast or banquet while partaking none of it for your own enjoyment. Christ's love is of that nature that we may have a spiritual sensation of it in our minds, which is why it is compared by the spouse to raisins and apples. We may taste that the Lord is gracious, and if we do not find a relish of Christ's love in our hearts, we will not long retain a notion of it in our minds. Christ is the meat, the bread, and the food of our souls. Nothing in him is of a higher spiritual nourishment than his love, which we should always desire. In this love, Christ is glorious, for it is such as no creatures, angels, or men could have the least conceptions of before it was manifested by its effects. 
and after its manifestation, it remains in this world absolutely incomprehensible.